Collisions occur all the time around us. We see collisions between vehicles, objects, and we have a decent amount of understanding. And we empirically know that the faster the speed of the car upon impact, and the heavier its mass, the greater the damage that it will cause. However, that's not the entire story. Apart from its mass and speed, we also sort of know that it depends on how the cars collide. For example, a head-on collision versus a ricochet, or hitting a moving target versus crashing into a big tree at rest. Why are some collisions more deadly than others? Furthermore, most of the collisions around us occur in the realm what we cannot see with our eyes. Today, we will learn about the principles behind collisions in terms of momentum and the law of conservation thereof. Welcome to another lecture on fundamental mechanics. Today we will learn about collisions, one of the most common ways particles, larger objects, interact with one another. In the previous lecture, we learned about momentum. Momentum is defined as a product of mass and velocity, which is a vector quantity. It acts like a unit as it contains important information, such as its mass, the substance, and its motion in terms of velocity. We also derive the law of conservation of momentum using Newton's second and third law. And today we will apply these principles to describe collisions. Now there are basically two types of collisions, elastic collisions and inelastic collisions. The dictionary definition of elastic is being able to resume its original shape after contraction, dilation or distortion. In this context, I would say that an elastic collision is where its original quantity such as momentum and energy is conserved after the collision. An inelastic collision would be everything but elastic. Let me categorize them into two columns, elastic and inelastic collisions. In an elastic collisions, let's consider two particles colliding with one another here. You have the initial momentum of particle 1 and a particle 2. And the conservation of momentum tells us that the sum of the initial momenta should be equal to the sum of the final momenta, the momentum 1 plus momentum 2 of its final momentum. So you can write here that the final momenta m1 v1 prime and v2 prime may have a different uh, values in comparison to v1 initial velocity v1 and v2 depending on the kind of collision they they've gone through um, but the sum of them the final momentum initial momentum is conserved um, according to this equation in an elastic collision there is no energy transfer from mechanical energy into thermal energy in other words the mechanical energy is conserved and, and more notably its kinetic energy is conserved and the momentum is conserved. This is the characteristics of an elastic collision. A perfect example of an elastic collision is billiards. The billiard balls are designed that it would bounce off one another with minimal loss of momentum. In most of the billiard games, you can witness a fairly close case of a perfectly elastic collision. In chemistry of fluid dynamics, we use ideal gas law to estimate the energy in the system. The very model of the ideal gas law assumes a perfectly elastic collision between molecules in the gas. And this is also a perfect example of an elastic collision. Now let's take a look at an inelastic collision. An inelastic collision, you have the initial momentum m1 v1 plus m2 and v2, but after the collision, you have, you have two particles emerged as a single entity. So you have the mass of m1 and m2 are, are added together because this is one entity, and they share a common velocity, the final velocity V prime. And in this case, the mechanical energy is not conserved, as the velocity here, the sum of the final velocity will not 
be equal to the initial initial velocity in any way because there will be a consumption of these kinetic energies into a thermal energy. So a mechanical energy transfer into a thermal energy does occur in an inelastic collision and the kinetic energy is not conserved while the momentum is still conserved as is described in the equation up here. A good example of an inelastic collision is a picture you see on the right hand side, a car running into a tree that was, that was at rest. Now in this case, the car and the trees both have its mass, and the car had an initial velocity before it ran into a tree, and while the tree, the velocity was zero, so its initial momentum was zero. After the collision, the car and the tree became one entity, so the mass of the car and the mass of the tree is added together, but the V' prime in this case is also equal to zero. So on the initial side, you do have a kinetic energy that is equal to one half m, the mass of the car, and the velocity of the car square. And for the tree, since it was stationary, it had zero kinetic energy, but after the collision, it all went to zero because their, com their uh, combined velocity is the V' prime is zero. So what happened to this kinetic energy? It all went into thermal energy. And in this case, that thermal energy is what will deform or destroy both the tree and the cars and, uh, and hopefully, hopefully not the people inside of the car. But this is why a head-on collision is more deadly than, than, than other types of collision. Let me give you an example uh, of um, a concrete example using a F-150 truck running into a tree. So an F-50 truck, its typical mass is about 5,000 pounds, which is about 2,200 kilograms. And let's say the tree, the, the car was, was driving around a neighborhood with a speed of 45 miles per hour, about 20 uh, meters per second. Then the kinetic energy of that, of that F-150 running into a truck is one half mv square, one half 2200 kilograms times 20 square. That equals to 440,000 joule of energy. And since all of that energy has, has gone into a thermal energy because the final velocity is zero, all of that thermal energy um, has gone into impact uh, the, the tree and the car. Now, how much is 440,000 joules of energy? One TNT, a dynamite, is, is roughly equivalent to about 4,000 joules. That means this amount of energy means an explosion of 110 grams of TNT. How does that look like? Now another crucial problem is that that explosion is occurring inside of your car. The thermal energy being transformed from a kinetic energy has no way to go. So they are trapped inside of the vehicle, tearing up and melting away anything in its path of propagation. This is why hitting a stationary tree or a pole is so deadly. And compared to a ricochet collision, as you can imagine, in a ricochet collision, although some of the kinetic energies are converted into thermal energy, they are split between objects that are physically apart. You are sharing the damage with an exit outlet for the heat to escape. Now let's take a look at a few problems to solve. Example 11.4 on inelastic glider collision. In a laboratory experiment, a 200 gram air track glider and a 400 gram air track glider are pushed toward each other from opposite ends of the track. The gliders have Velcro tabs on the front and will stick together when they collide. In other words, they will have an inelastic collision. The 200 gram glider is pushed with initial speed of 3.0 meters per second and the collision causes it to reverse direction at 0.4 meters per second. What was the initial speed of the 400 gram glider? 
So in a before setting, you have cart 1 with its mass and the initial velocity going to the right. And the cart 2 has its initial mass and the velocity that's going to the left. In this case, the velocity 2 initial would have a minus sign. Afterwards, because of the Velcro, these two carts will stick together and will travel um, in, in, with the common velocity they share. So let's, so let's solve this using the inelastic collision equation. We're given that the inelastic collision, we have mass 1, velocity 1, plus mass to velocity 2, is equal to m1 plus m2, their mass combined, and the common velocity v prime. And we're here given the mass, all the masses, and we're given all of the velocity except the initial velocity of the cart 2. Well, this is simply a plug it in uh, a problem. You plug it in here 0.2 for its mass, and the velocity here was positive 3.0. Plus, you have a mass 2, which is 0.4, but the velocity here should be v2, which would be a minus quantity. And on the other side, you will have 0.6, and v prime in this case is minus 0 0.4. So in this example, you are given all the information except v2, and you can easily cancel for v2 in this case. Now let's take a look at a little bit more interesting example. Uh, example so-called the ballistic pendulum. Now in this case, a 10 gram bullet is fired into a 1200 gram wood block hanging from a 150 centimeter long string. So you have, uh, you have a wood block here, 1200 grams is hanging from a ceiling with a length uh, 1.5 meters or 150 centimeters. The bullet embeds itself to the block. So you have a bullet that is fired into this wood block and the block then swings out to an angle of 40 degrees. So from the initial height, this will gain a certain kinetic energy. I'm sorry, potential energy. What was the speed of the bullet? Okay, so we have learned about the uh, pendulum case that um, let's try to describe its gained potential energy because we're going to use it. We know that gravitational potential energy is mgy, and in this case, y is L minus L cosine theta. And that is because the length, if you take a look at the angle here, this length here would be the total length L minus L cosine theta, this part. So this part here is L minus L cosine theta. All right, now let's consider in this case, this is an inelastic collision case, so still we use the same equation, m1 v1 plus m2 v2 is equal to m1 plus m2 v prime. Now we're given the bullet, so I'm going to write here 0 0.01 kilogram for the bullet and the velocity of the initial velocity of the bullet plus the uh, 1200, so 1 1.2 for the mass and velocity is zero because it was simply hanging from the ceiling. After the collision, we have 1.21, which is the, the, the addition of these two masses here, and they have a common velocity free prime. So here I have 0 0.01 Vb is equal to 1.21 V prime. So Vv in terms of V prime is this. Now this is not yet um, enough 
because we have two unknowns with one simple uh, single equation. So we need another um, principle to another equation to, to solve this. Now, in an inelastic case, remember, inelastic case, the mechanical energy is not conserved. Meaning that if I write, simply write, like this, they will be a change of energy thermal, the thermal energy that dissipates out compared to the initial state. So since we do not know about this portion, this is not a good approach to, to go cons uh, considering the heat component. So what we're going to do, we're going to consider the following. We're not going to start from the very beginning, but we're going to begin as soon as the bullet embeds inside of the wood block and the heat transfer happened already. Then the remaining energy after the heat transfer, that part of the energy should be conserved. So that part of the energy should be conserved in terms of the mechanical energy and you will see what I mean here. So the initial the initial would be one half mass of the bullet and not the velocity of the initial velocity of the bullet, but V prime. This is after the bullets embeds inside of the wood block, then they begin to travel together after the heat, the, the thermal energy component. So this part from this point on, each, the mechanical energy should be conserved. And as soon as it travels upward, of course, the potential energy is zero and all the kinetic energy goes away in terms of the gravitational potential energy. And here we know it's one half. Here is 0.01 V prime is equal to M G Y. Y is L L cosine theta, of course. So here, actually, this um, this is this is the um, this is not just the mass of the bullet. This is the mass of the bullet and the mass of the wood here, and this is the same mass here. So they actually will cancel out because we're talking about after the bullets being embedded into the wood traveling together. So whatever mass that you put here, the mass will part will cancel out. So you have. V prime over half equal to G L, L minus L cosine theta. So you will have V prime, this is square by the way, sorry for that, would be square root of two G L minus L cosine theta. Now I now have an expression for V prime. And once I have that, then I can simply substitute that into here. Now we know all of these values, hence we can solve for the initial velocity of the bullet. All right, so let me reiterate once again um, how to solve this problem. We consider this an inelastic collision case. So we use the conservation momentum considering inelastic collision, which is this. Then we found out that we have, we're not given enough information to just simply solve uh, plug in and play. And uh, we need another set of equations. Whenever you need another equation in a momentum problem, you will be using the conservation of energy. You either just use the conservation of a kinetic energy, or in this case, conservation of mechanical energy, both the kinetic and the potential energy together. One important part is that you should not apply this for the entire system from the very beginning because in an inelastic collision, mechanical energy is not conserved. When the bullet embeds itself in a wood block, there will be an energy loss, the, the, the mechanical energy loss into a thermal energy. So we pass that point 
after the heat transfer occurs, then what is left, what is remaining, that part of the mechanic energy should be conserved. So we have the initial kinetic energy with one half, the two masses combined together, and the, and the common velocity of V prime. And then we assume that's the ground level, so that the potential energy there is zero. All of that kinetic energy went into a potential energy raising this woodblock plus bullet to a height of y. And this height of y is, of course, described as L minus L cosine theta. And then, and then you can finally describe the V prime in terms of the parameters that we know. And then you can plug that V prime back to it and finally write down um, the, the initial velocity of the bullet. Now, this seemingly short, relatively short question actually has a multiple parts to consider. And, there, and the logic and reasoning that goes behind it. So this is not an elementary problem, although each step uh, maybe break, in, break into elementary steps. Um, so just remember this example, the, bol the ballistic pendulum experiment. Now regarding the elastic um, collision case, there is one additional tool that I need to introduce to you. Consider a two billiard balls that is approaching one another. Now in this case, I have the, the initial momentum m1 v1 plus m2 v2, and then the final I have m1 v1 prime, m2 v2 prime. Now unless I'm given all of this information, just to solve this um, analytically, you will notice here there are many, many par parameters. And there are times that the question will not give you all of the information. The only, the only time that you can simply solve this without any aid is that you're given the entire information but one. Um, but oftentimes that will not be the case. And then you will, you will need to use a second set of equations. In this case, um, what we can use is the conservation of kinetic um, energy because it's an elastic collision. So in the kinetic energy, you have one half m1 v1 square plus m2 v2 square for the initial and the final. And here now you have um, enough, you will have enough information because you will be given probably the initial uh, or the partial of the final and then you can definitely can use these two equations to solve any parameters. Now the problem with this is this is algebraically laborious. So let me give you an example here. Um, I'm going to simplify it. So consider these two bowls approaching one another. If I am measuring from this reference point, I have m1 v1 coming in this way and I have minus m2 v2 because the v2 component will be minus. I could also move my reference point to over here. What this means is that I'm going to consider the reference point of frame 2 to be stationary and the ball 1 is simply approaching to the reference point of of ball B. And the advantage of doing this is that I could set V2 is equal to zero. So I can simplify one of the equation. And if here for the V1, this will actually become the velocity of V1 and V2 together. So this leads to M1 V1, which is really the, uh, the addition of the two initial velocity there, um, plus M2 v2 but v2 is 0 is equal to m1 v1 prime plus m2 v2 prime. Now v1 and v2 I cannot combine them because they will have their own velocity after the collisions. So here I have m1 v1 is equal to m1 v1 prime plus m2 v2 prime v2 prime and I want to write this in terms of v1 prime. So v m1 v1 prime is m1 v1 minus m2 v2 prime. And I will divide all this by mass 1. 
So then I have V1 prime is equal to V1 minus M2 M1 V2 prime. Once I've done that, I'm going to substitute V1 prime here. And this will take um, some laborious algebraic steps. These are not hard, it's just some long lines of algebra um, derivation, which is not so meaningful. Um, um, so I'm going to leave that into the textbook that where you can find it. The result of that, that product is, is here. And it's important that you understand what this means here. Now, re now here, this is basically V1, the initial velocity of particle 1. This is a, a perfect elastic collision with ball 2 initially at rest. So this is in a relativistic frame of reference. The V2 is 0 here. So once you know the initial velocity of, of ball 1, V1, in this case in the relativistic scale, you can directly find out the final velocity, the V1 prime or V2 prime immediately in terms of its mass. So let me give you an example here. A 50 gram marble moving at 2.0 meters per second strikes a 20 gram marble at rest. What is the speed of each marble immediately after the collision? So it's asking you V1 prime and V2 prime. And if you want to solve this a long way, you notice here you have two masses are given. You have only one, you have the uh, uh, V1 here is given, and you have given V2 is equal to zero. But to solve this for the final, you, re you realize you have two unknowns, V1 prime and V2 prime. And to solve V1 prime and V2 prime, you will have to then use a conservation of kinetic energy in this case, and that you will then again go through a long lines of substitution. So to cut that short for simplicity's sake, we have this product of those derivations. So you already have a form where you just need to plug it in its mass ratios in terms of V1 prime and V2 prime. So V1 prime you will have um, M1 minus M2, so uh, 0 0.05 minus 0 0.02 divided by 0.07 and you multiply by 2.0 meters per second that is v1 and voila you have the answer for v1 prime and you do the same thing for v2 prime you multiply 2.05 divided by 0.07 multiplied by 2.0 it will give you v2 prime so these expressions these tools are given for you to save time basically now for our last example, let's consider a two-dimensional case. How do we solve a two-dimensional case? Because after all, two-dimensional case is more or, or common, let's say in a billiard uh, uh, games or, or in general. So how do we solve the conservation momentum and the collision cases in two dimensions? A 20 gram ball of clay traveling east at 3 meters per second collides with a 30 gram ball of clay traveling north at 2.0 meters per second. What are the speed and the direction of the resulting 50 gram ball of clay? Now in two dimensional cases is nothing different from a one dimensional case. So the situation here is that you have clay 1 with mass m, m1 is traveling east 3.0 meters per second and the clay 2 with M mass M2 is traveling up north 2.0 meters per second. And this will be an inelastic collision case, so M1 and M2 will add up together with a commonly shared velocity of V prime. So we start writing the exact same equation in an inelastic case. And here, strictly speaking, we are going to deal with vectors, since we're dealing with a two-dimensional case. So, this would be 
the mass one 0.02 and velocity is 3.0 meters per second east that is 3.0 i plus 0 j plus mass 2 0.03 times 0 i plus 2.0 j that is equal to 0 0.05 And for V' prime, we will assign an arbitrary vector, x i plus y j, and we'll be solving for the x and y here. So here, this would be 0.06 i, I'll skip the zero part, plus 0.06 j is equal to 0.05 x i plus 0.05 y j. And here, this, and this, and this, and this have to equal, because that's the only i and j component existing here. So you can solve for x and y, which is, in this case, both the same. 0 0.05, sorry, 6 divided by 0 0.05, which is 1.2. That tells me that the brief prime, finally, the answer is 1.2i, plus 1.2j. Now from this unit factor form, remember that you can get the magnitude and the directionality um, all um, from the unit vector format. So if I ask you for, um, or the question asks you for the magnitude of this vector, you can find the, through the Pythagorean theorem to find the magnitude and also the angle between by taking the inverse tangent. Now that covers all the examples we want to go over um, with the collisions. Unlike in a car accident, there are situations where you may desire a head-on collision. A crash car test would be a good example where you want to test the safety feature of a new car under the uh, pressure of the uh, head-on collision. But there is more drastic example than this, but this one occurs at a subatomic level inside of the largest particle accelerator on the planet, LHC. This is the Large Hadron Collider, or LHC for short. It's a 27-kilometer particle accelerator sitting under the border of France and Switzerland. It's an atom smasher, the biggest in the world, designed and built by thousands of engineers, scientists, and mathematicians from across our tiny planet with the goal of helping other scientists learn about things of incredibly small size by smashing them together. These smashings are called collisions. This is really all they're interested in. Yeah. They're interested in collisions, collisions, collisions. That's Mike Lamont. He's the operations group leader working on the LHC. It's his job to run BEAM beam being nerdy lingo for bunches of hydrogen protons that fill up the LHC. The LHC is a ring containing two beams going in opposite directions, but if we look closer, that beam is actually made up of bunches of protons. In fact, each bunch has about 100 billion protons each, and these bunches are about 30 centimeters long, um, typically about a millimeter di dimensions as they're going around the ring. And um, so think about a long, thin, tapered piece of spaghetti. Incredibly powerful superconducting magnets keep the beams flying at nearly the speed of light with the aim of making these proton bunches hit. We pass these thin hairs through each other and we get about 30 collisions. So most of the, most of the protons just miss each other and they carry on around the ring. They come back, late, come back one turn later and they can do it again. And the reason why they miss each other is because atoms are mostly empty space. So getting them to collide is incredibly difficult. It would be like standing 10 kilometers apart and trying to shoot two needle-thin arrows at each other so they hit halfway. So the key is to do this a lot. The target this year, just to put it in context, is about 800 million collisions a second. So we really kind of, we have to work hard to get that rate. Hundreds of millions per second is insane. Imagine trying to control a proton traveling at nearly the speed of light. To keep the bunches on track, the LHC uses dipole magnets, or two magnets. But when they need to steer the protons, they use quadrupole magnets, or four, one on each compass point, applying three to 400 metric tons of force per meter. 
So we take our, our pieces of spaghetti and focus them down with very strong quadrupole magnets, which act like lenses, to get them down to the diameter of a human hair as we pass them through, the, uh, through each other in the center of the ex experiments. And that is why the LHC is in the business of collisions. The LHC is sort of like your power company, but instead of providing electricity, they're generating collisions. More collisions, more better. They spend all their effort to try and get these bunches of hydrogen ions to hit inside of other scientists' experiments. Of course, having a collision is great, but if a proton collides in the woods and no one's there, does it make a boson? Who knows? The scientists still have to be watching at just the right fraction of a second to discover a new particle. That's where these experiments come in. They sit on the LHC ring at collision points, and they're probably what you think of when you hear Large Hadron Collider. The famous ones are ATLAS and CMS, which spotted the famous Higgs boson back in 2013. It's called CMS, compact muon solenoid. However, it really is not compact. Mm -hmm. It's a relative term, as you can see. Uh, nothing of that size is compact. Dr. Talika Bose sits in the control room of the CMS, waiting for an exciting collision to happen inside her three-story science experiment, all thanks to the LHC. So they, they collide about 25 nanoseconds. So you have a bunch colliding with another bunch. You may have a proton here and a proton here, which has a hard what we call scattering, a hard event, and out of that comes out a whole mess of particles. This is what she's talking about. When two protons collide, it looks like this. To you and me, this may look like a whole mess of particle parts, but to Dr. Bose, this mess can actually tell you what's inside a proton. There are two important pieces of information that we get from this. One is whether it's curving this way or if it's curving that way. That tells us whether it's positively charged or negatively charged. And then how large is the radius of curvature? Because it could be curving like this or it could be curving in a much larger radius. Uh, and, and this has a direct uh, relationship with essentially what the velocity and consequently what the, the momentum of the particle mm -hmm. is. And this is why the LHC is awesome. Dr. Bose is basically watching millions of proton car crashes in order to reverse engineer the automobile. Smashing atoms together can reveal what they're made of, but instead of injectors, plastic, steel, and glass, physicists find neutrons, kaons, pions, muons, and neutrinos. By the way, physicists call particles that are made of these things hadrons, hence the name Large Hadron Collider. Proton collisions like these help physicists reveal exactly what these tiny structures that make up our universe are made of. The technology is super advanced, but the science is the same as it's always been. We simply break things apart, hoping to understand how they tick. <laughs>